Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second day of the World Economic Forum on the Middle East and North Africa here at the banks of the Dead Sea in Jordan. The situation of the refugees in the region is the topic of this press conference. A welcome to everybody here in the room and also welcome to our audience on the live stream. It is fair to say that the crisis, the refugee crisis the region is experiencing is at unprecedented levels. And um, you will see throughout the program today, kicking off with this press conference, that it's an important topic on the agenda of the World Economic Forum here. And I'm very pleased to have this uh, very distinct panel with us today, which is uh, in this very morning moment completed. Thank you for joining us as well. Um, to my immediate left, I'm joined by Elaine Weidmann-Brunewald. She's the Vice President for Sustainability and Corporate Responsibility of Ericsson. <laughs> Next to her, uh, we're joined by Mark Schnellbecker, who's the Regional Director and Syria Crisis Response for the International Rescue Committee. Further down the line, we're uh, pleased to be joined today by Andrew Harper, who's the Jordan representative of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And last but definitely not least, we're joined by Ahmad al Hanande, who is the Chief Executive Officer of SIGN here in Jordan. Thank you for joining us uh, today. And um, without further ado, um, I'll hand over uh, to you, Mr. Harper. Um, you are the representative of UNHCR here uh, in Jordan and in the region. Uh, please uh, give us an update on the situation. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to say how bad is it, but um, I'll uh, ask you to give us a briefing there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and, and I think it's also um, critically important to, to recognise um, the, the symbolism of, of involving um, refugees in the World Economic Forum because refugees are, are a stakeholder. Um, they are, are an important influencer uh, and they're not going to be going away anytime soon in the Middle East and North Africa, so we have to take them very much into account. Uh, it's, as you quite rightly noted, it, we're facing an unprecedented level of displacement. Uh, it's just, it just seems too easy to sort of say unprecedented level. Uh, if anything, it's terrifying. Uh, we're seeing numbers which no one could have ever dreamt of uh, appearing in the Middle East. We're seeing uh, over half of Syria's population affected and that level is going to increase rather than decrease. We're seeing borders not only in the region but further afield uh, restricting access to safety. Um, we're not only seeing national borders restricting uh, access for refugees to, um, to flee the violence, we're also seeing increasing attempts by states to restrict internal movement. And this is forcing people into increasing poverty and, and increasing despair. We can rattle off any numbers that you wish to because um, they're just, they're, they're, they're enormous, they're almost beyond belief. But when you start talking about 12 million Syrians in need of support, uh, 8 million who are internally displaced, almost 4 million who are, who are refugees, uh, millions more in, inside Iraq are in need, like, what, what do the numbers mean? But each, 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 each one of these is human beings, each one of these are, are just trying to, to survive, protect their family, get the kids into school, make sure their family is um, healthy and maintain the dignity. And this is all basically being destroyed. And so if we're talking about economic progress um, as underpinning stability and security in the region, we have to address these underlying um, areas of disruption. And we also have to address the underlying vulnerabilities of the people who have been um, so adversely affected. We're not going to see a change anytime soon. Um, with, the, with the increasing level of violence, the, the destruction, uh, what we knew of um, the Middle East five, six, seven years ago in, in some aspects is, has changed irreparably. But what we have to do now is, is find ways in which we can prevent um, the violence, the extremism, the radicalization from um, perpetuating even increased violence and destruction. And we have to start looking at how we can make the the most of the refugees and to uh, restart their lives. Uh, it, the refugees in the region and further afield are not going to be able to go home anytime soon, not in the next days, next weeks, next months. So in that context, how do we, rather than seeing them as, as challenges or burdens, how do we also see them as opportunities? How do we see them as human beings? 
how do we how do we treat refugees as you'd like to be treated <coughs> and that is each one of you just want to protect your family each one of you just want to provide for your family maintain your dignity but it's not just about ourselves as well it's also that we need to be able to provide for our communities um, the refugees are skilled they're educated and they can actually contribute and I'm I'm focusing on this element because we are talking about the World Economic Forum and it would be amiss to just see refugees and migrants as liabilities. You'll probably not find anyone who's more enthusiastic and uh, dedicated to provide for their family, to work hard, uh, to work conscientiously and with the skills to be transferred. We've also got to invest in the future as well. Uh, people sort of saying we don't want to have a, a lost generation, some aspects we already have. Uh, the question then is how to mitigate the, the next generations. If you've been out of school, um, as, I, as I believe there's at least 600,000 um, Syrian refugees, but if you take into account what's happening in, in Syria, you're talking millions. And if you're out of school for a year or two years, it's extremely unlikely that you're going to be able to go back. And this then creates the potential for a downward spiral of, of despair, vulnerability uh, and potential exploitation. Also, when we're talking about refugees, um, and people sort of say, well, like, we need to focus on the families and the communities to, to mitigate attempts at exploitation or extremism or uh, influenced by radicalization. But what if the family's already been destroyed? What if families have been split? What if communities have been split and destroyed? So we have to think differently. And this is not just a regional uh, question, because it's too easy for many Western states um, or Gulf states to say, look, um, we're providing 10 million, 20 million, 100 million dollars to, uh, to Jordan or Lebanon or elsewhere. This is, this is completely inappropriate to what we're being faced with here. When uh, Turkey's provided something like 7 billion dollars worth of direct support to refugees, when Jordan has pr been providing billions of dollars, billions of dollars which it doesn't have, um, sharing scarce water which it doesn't have, uh, scarce resources which it doesn't have. It, it, it means that the, the countries which are providing the asylum space, who have been so generous in their tradition of providing shelter to pe people to people fleeing violence, they're being taken for granted because the international community is not grasping the full extent of what is occurring and the dangers that could follow if they do not invest properly. So this is not a, a crisis that can just be addressed by the UN, for instance, or the government, or by the private sector. It is, it is a crisis which everyone has to come together and say, how do we address what is a completely horrific situation, a situation which is, appears to have no end, but in order also to protect the most fundamental human rights of those people who have been affected uh, due to no fault of their own. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think, uh, as you said, the situation really is terrifying and uh, it is, is clearly one of the most pressing, if not the most pressing issues in the region. Now, the World Economic Forum, and you mentioned that everybody has to come to the table to work on this, is an international institution for uh, public-private cooperation. So it's no surprise that we are joined by uh, representatives of the private sector today. However, I'll still put that question to you, Elaine. What can be the role of the private sector and uh, what, is th what is your company, Ericsson, doing to, to help in this case? I would say that, um, I mean, with the, the backdrop that was just painted, I mean, the role of the private sector has been pretty underutilized, I think, in, in the world of humanitarian response. And um, having uh, participated in Davos, one thing that uh, stuck in my mind that, that came out of the, the World Economic Forum there was that um, today there are, there are more conflicts in the world today than ever in the history of humankind. And I think that's a, a pretty overwhelming uh, statement if, if you think about it. And, and it's not just the Syrian conflict, it's, it's things, um, whether it's a natural disaster or or a conflict, if you look at what's happening in Nepal and many other parts of the world. So I, I would say that um, Andrew talked about looking at refugees as challenges and burdens and, and, or uh, stereotype around that. I think there's quite a lot of uh, solutions that, that companies can, can bring to the discussion. I think often um, companies are looked at as a source of, you know, 
charity or donations, but I, I think probably the more important role that we can play from the private sector, and in our case from Ericsson's side, being a technology company, is bringing some of the knowledge and the skills and the resources that we have in terms of technology and, and, and staff into addressing some of these uh, conflicts. And, and really, I think that in the future, these types of public-private partnerships are gonna be the, the model that will be needed in order to, to start to meaningfully address and, and solve some of these um, challenges. Um, you have the, uh, all the statistics around refugees from, from the different experts on the panel. I, I'd like to put a few technology statistics out there. Um, if you look at how uh, telecommunication and ICT has developed, it took basically 100 years to connect a billion people. It took uh, roughly, I would say, 25 years to connect five billion uh, places. And, and over a 25-year period, there will be, going through 2020, there will be 50 billion connected devices. So the pace of change has never been faster. Yet at the same time, I think there's a gap between effective policy uh, and, and being able to leverage the technology that exists today. And in 2015, there will be more mobile subscriptions on the planet than, than there are people. This, in 2015, that, that number will be surpassed. And I think that um, there is no other technology in the world today that has scaled, uh, like the mobile industry, in a way that can bring economic growth, that can bring social and financial inclusion, and that can give people a voice to be part of the broader world. So those are some of the statistics, you could say, in, in the private sector side. And I would say the challenge is to know what partners to leverage and how to leverage that incredible deployment of, of infrastructure that's out there, and in this case, in, in the refugee context. Um, there's a couple of initiatives uh, that I would like to mention that, that we work on from Ericsson's side. I would say the most basic when it comes to refugees is, is you know, around basic connectivity. I personally started to engage in, in the refugee issue in 2007. Uh, and we worked with UNHCR in Uganda and some other partners to put up uh, a mobile tower in northern Uganda on the border to South Sudan in a place called Ajimani. We put up a mobile tower and it was subsidized by Ericsson and the mobile operator there. And we didn't really know how would this impact you know, on, on the lives of refugees there. And, and after one week of that tower being up, it was over capacity. The need to communicate was so great that uh, even in this remote place where no one, you know, there wasn't a lot of hope, nobody thought that people would even have phones. Every refugee had phones. They all had phones, and they all needed to communicate and find family and uh, missing loved ones. And so that was 2007. Fast forward to today, you have social media, you have all the ways of, of communicating and, and, you know, incredible platforms of being able to bring people together. And in one program, we... Um, recently launched together with uh, Zayn here in Jordan, but, but also in Turkey and Iraq, is a, a, a program called Refugees United. It's a basic mobile platform where refunite.org, where anyone can register if they're searching. It's a basic uh, search and match program and find missing family and loved ones. And the thing about that program, it's, it's really about awareness and knowing that it exists. There's about 400,000 refugees registered today on the platform. Um, and so it's grown over time. When, when Ericsson started to engage in that, there was about 10,000 and it wasn't mobile. So we worked with this NGO to help them bring their, their idea to a mobile environment. And uh, today we've done over 1,000 real reconnections. So it's, it's just, it's the most low tech basic thing you could do. It's SMS and USST. It's just one example. Um, another thing we've been working with is, is education and looking at how to um, through mobile broadband, bring in education into to low income and, and very um, rural or urban environments, looking how to use uh, cloud technology to, to improve access to education. And um, we work a lot with that, especially for girls and, and with a focus on gender. Um, and, and I'd say the, the last example I'll give is, is our program around emergency response. We've been working for 15 years on helping um, the UN and the emergency telecom cluster in, in places like Nepal, where we have five people on the ground today, helping to put up emergency telecom in order to enable 
you know, the communication that's so vital. So those are just a few examples from, from Erickson's side of, of how we see technology and how the private sector can play a role. And, it, and it's not done with the mentality of, of charity or philanthropy. It's done with a mentality of what is our core business and how can we apply it to this specific uh, problem. Thanks. Thank you, Elaine, for sharing these insights. Now, um, Ahmed, Jordan has been historically a host country for refugees and is, is again, uh, um, right in the middle of, the, of this crisis, if you will. You are the, the CEO of Jordan, of a Jordan company. Um, what is your perspective? Um, Elaine mentioned a cooperation with Erickson and Sane, but uh, please uh, tell us what do you think, uh, what, what can you do on the ground here? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, uh, and, and thank you for, for having uh, this session to discuss such an important issue. Uh, I'll, I'll just be uh, focused on, on how technology is, is uh, helping into the uh, refugees' issues. Uh, according to the UNHCR latest uh, number that we have seen on registered refugees in Jordan, we have around 627 registered with UNHCR. According to the UNHCR website, uh, uh, I believe Jordan hosts more than a million Syrian refugees. Some of them, most of them are unregistered uh, refugees. They don't live in camps or not registered with UNHCR. Talking about refugees, they're here. I agree with UNHCR. They're here to stay. I don't think they're going to leave any soon. Uh, and uh, we cannot ignore now the basic needs of, of humans. Uh, uh, keeping the fact that they're refugees on the side where they need education, uh, they need uh, uh, jobs that secures income for them. They need to, uh, they need entertainment, uh, and they need uh, to receive uh, 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 their, a way to receive their funds, especially for those who are staying in the camps. An easy way of getting the funds and uh, and and uh, spending this fund. Uh, of course. Uh, with the technology uh, available in Jordan, uh, with with the evolvement of the uh, uh, telecommunication uh, uh, and data services uh, across the world, it becomes uh, easier uh, to provide services for the refugees and uh, to come up with initiatives that can help refugees uh, uh, in a better way and in a in, in, in an efficient way. So uh, according to a study done for the um, Syrian refugees in Lebanon, for example, and when the refugees were asked, you know, how do you uh, uh, deal with, with technology and what is it in the technology that you're using so much, they, they use the SMS news service so they know what's happening in their own country. Uh, uh, they use the, uh, the, the call centers and hotlines, and, and I believe with the UNHCR there was an initiative where they launched uh, uh, we were we were uh, happy to 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 be partner with UNHCR on this to launch a hotline and a call center for the Syrian refugees in Jordan. Uh, uh, they use the they, they need internet, and, and most of the refugees uh, uh, seeks an access to the internet. I agree with Elena. Social platforms, uh, access to social platforms became a necessity for those people because this is the only way that they can connect to their relatives, to their home country. Uh, they can know what's going around, uh, so they they need uh, uh, an internet access, and and uh, we realize that you know there has to be places where they can go and connect to internet, like internet cafes within the camps or or hot hotspot zones within the camps. Uh, they need mobile phones. I agree again with Elena. Most of them need uh, have already own mobile phones, um, and they need access to applications that allows them to uh, communicate with their uh, with their uh, with with each other or their relatives back home or with their relatives anywhere else in the world there is a study on the on the on the access to technology 14% uh, of the refugees uh, did not have access to mobile phone that means 86% do have access to mobile phones 40% uh, of those having access to a mobile phone they actually own uh, a smartphone and when we say a smartphone you know smartphone is from 70 jds up to uh, 700 up to 1000 out to up to 700 jds phone so um, i'm not talking you know they're having a sophisticated smartphone but they have a phone that ca that give them access to internet uh, uh, 14% of those could not make calls because they don't have money to pay for the uh, for the call and that's where the call center 
uh, 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 initiative was so important, allow them to, to make call when they don't have credit. Uh, main use of the mobile phone uh, was to receive calls, uh, sending and receiving SMSs, uh, uh, and very few takes photos and share it over social media, very few. Uh, uh, WhatsApp is an application that they depend on, in general, uh, uh, those of uh, uh, with a higher education prefer SMS, while the direct calls are preferred in the less educated population. 66% uh, of the people interviewed stated it would be extremely useful to receive aid uh, uh, information on their uh, aid information on their mobile phones, and that's what uh, I, I believe UNHCR is trying to promote here in Jordan. So uh, it's so many statistics that that's going on. Uh, we tried as Zane Jordan, as a technology provider here in Jordan, to 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 make most of what they need according to the statistics and studies available. We had uh, some initiatives, some with UNHCR, others with the, uh, the I believe with the with the UNRWA. Uh, uh, we are working on the uh, mobile money payments for the refugees. Uh, we're trying to help in the camps as much as possible. We made the access to telecommunication services as affordable as possible. We made the access to internet as affordable as possible. Uh, and a successful uh, uh, example of how technology can help uh, in, in such cases is what we did with Ericsson as well and Refugee United where uh, without the technology platform and without the easy access to uh, the technology <coughs> platform it could not have been done. Refugees United uh, uh, with Ericsson uh, signed with Zane and we activated the service and the beauty of this service it, no, it does not need the access to internet. It can be done over a USSD service which is similar to an SMS. That makes it easy, they register, and then it's Refugees United role to, to try to find their, their relatives or counterparties uh, anywhere else in the world and then connect them both together, uh, which is a fantastic initiative, I think, and uh, um, uh, the, 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 uh, with the numbers that, that after the mobile operators got involved and the numbers that uh, Refugees United managed to, uh, uh, the increase they managed to achieve in the registered cases uh, is it, too big. In Jordan, we're going to speak to uh, the um, UN organization, especially the UNHCR, address them and how we can promote this to the Syrian refugees here in Jordan. In Jordan, of course, they're very close to their home country. They're on the border with their home country. They're even using uh, their phones. Uh, usually, they call their home country back, uh, where the rates for calling home country is not too expensive. Uh, but still, uh, uh, this would be an excellent platform for them to use and connect to uh, the, uh, their relatives whom they don't know where, where they are, uh, where they where they actually are. And we're looking more. Um, this is basically when it comes to refugees and in, 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 uh, in, 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 in and how we can utilize the technology platform to help refugees. Uh, of course, the partnerships is extremely important. Uh, the partnership with Ericsson and Refugees United got us here uh, to speak about this uh, initiative. Uh, we had uh, a successful partnerships with UNHCR. Uh, 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 in, in providing uh, uh, telecommunication solutions to the uh, to the refugees, but that that tells you, you know how how important is the value of private, public, semi-public uh, partnerships and and what can comes out of it. Uh, uh, it's important to have private private partnership and public public uh, partnership as well. So, uh, um, of course, this is a challenge. A refugees uh, file in Jordan is a big challenge. It's a big challenge for the government. It's a big challenge for the community. Uh, hosting community is extremely important, and that's why we got an initiative uh, that, that has to do with the development, uh, with certain development projects in the hosting community of the refugees. And this is very important. We cannot ignore that they, they, they live in, in, uh, in a Jordanian community that also needs help at the end of the day. So that's what I have to say for today. Um, I'm sorry if I have taken uh, longer than what I should. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. I think with the importance of the topic, it's fine if we if we run over a little bit. But let's let's go full circle. Mark, you're representing the the NGO sector here. You're the regional director for the for, for the International Rescue Committee. So you do a lot of work on the ground. Um, I have two questions for you. A, tell us a bit about your work, 
and B, we have not just uh, the two uh, business uh, representatives here on the panel, but we have hundreds of CEOs also here in the conference center. If you could, uh, let's say I'm, I'm the fairy and I, I give you a wish, what you, would you be your wish to these CEOs? What, what would you, your call be? Would you say what can they do? Uh, uh, what would help? Thank you. Well, maybe, thank you. Maybe I'll set it up by, by saying that a lot of us who work in this field and many colleagues in UNHCR and, and other organizations in the humanitarian field are, are really concerned that the system that has served refugees pretty well for the last 50 or 60 years is really straining and buckling under the pressure. Um, you've heard a couple of people say that Syrians are likely to be here for a long time. Worldwide, the average duration of forced displacement is 17 years worldwide. So a system that was built up to be an emergency response system to help people as they're fleeing conflict is now being asked to look after people for decades. The system itself, which relied largely on local governments and local communities to bear, uh, to bear the great majority of the burden and the cost, assisted by international organizations like uh, like UNHCR and, and private humanitarian agencies like International Rescue Committee, we, we can no longer do this by ourselves. And, and the, the case with Syrian refugees, I think, is, is particularly uh, illustrative of that. So the time is now that we've got to think differently about how everybody works together to try to respond to a problem that, that is growing. And so whereas I think you know, t for the last 10 years or so, the involvement of the private sector, um, whether in cons with consulting companies or ICT companies, has been uh, an innovative sideline um, of, of a lot of the work that we do. It seems to me that now it needs to be brought much more into the, into the mainstream and, and the private sector becomes a full partner just like the UN specialized agencies working with local governments and organizations like my own um, in a new tripartite partnership to try to deal with, with some of these problems. Um, because I agree with the assessment, unfortunately Syrians uh, will not have the opportunity to go home for a long time and yet uh, they have a lot to contribute and they also have a lot of needs. I think with specifically with ICT, um, we call it ICT for programs. Um, it's become sort of a subsector uh, of specialization in our, in our field. We have colleagues who work in this field now. Um, they, it's really helping us to do humanitarian action in a more responsive and a more effective and a, a, a more accountable way. And more importantly than that, I think, is that it also provides the opportunity, a growing opportunity, for the people we serve to have information and access to information that they can use to improve their situations. So it's not just to benefit and make us more efficient and effective. It also has opportunities for uh, um, allowing, you, you talked about dignity of refugees, and, and to restore some of the autonomy that people who are refugees lose by dint of their forced displacement. For example, IRC is now developing in, in Lebanon uh, something we call uh, Service Info, which is basically Yelp for refugees. It's an online platform where service providers uh, can, can register themselves. Refugees can uh, use their mobile phones to find out who, what clinic is in my area, providing what services at what hour. And more importantly than after they use a service or buy something from a, a tradesman, they can go back on and rate. Uh, did I receive timely assistance at that clinic? Did they treat me well? Uh, do I feel like um, they gave me the right diagnosis or whatever? So that people can actually, cre we can create a feedback loop and we can create opportunities for beneficiary feedback. Because many things, uh, many of us who work in this field and certainly many refugees feel the lack of autonomy uh, is, a, is a huge loss. So anything like this uh, service info that can restore some of that autonomy is, is uh, most welcome. Um, secondly, we operate inside Syria from the neighboring countries completely by remote management. This is a new way of operating for us. We normally are able to go and do pro program monitoring, program needs assessments with our own staff. Here it's all by fly-by-wire from around from the surrounding countries. So we need to develop new ways to be 
sure that, you know, are we responding to the correct needs? Is stuff we're sending in getting to where it's meant to be and the like? So we've worked with a couple of uh, freight companies like DHL and FedEx and Aramex to develop a similar um, tracking system for commodities uh, using QR codes and, and whatnot, which helps us greatly enhance our ability to assure ourselves and assure our donors that this stuff is not being uh, pilfered or, or picked up uh, by, by people who shouldn't be getting their hands on it. Uh, inside Syria, we're also using tablets and mobile platforms to do needs assessment and, and beneficiary uh, uh, reporting uh, on, the serv on service utilization we just basically beam it up to the cloud, it gets immediately downloaded, and then the tablet erases itself because people are very concerned about that kind of information falling. This is all in war zones. People are very concerned about that kind of information falling into uh, hands we'd rather not see fall, we'd rather not see it fall into. So this is another way we're able to um, improve our, our, our targeting and, and responsiveness. We have a global agreement with Ericsson uh, that in this region, in northern Iraq, uh, we're working <clears throat> with their uh, Connect to Learn program, uh, where, which is providing teacher training and uh, a, a suite of uh, curriculum materials uh, that supplement uh, the work we're doing in primary and secondary schools, both in camps and, and outside of camps in, uh, in northern Iraq. So those are just some of the examples of things that we've been able to do that, that both improve um, our ability to get at uh, concerns and, and needs that refugees themselves um, have expressed, um, and it and and it allows us to 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 make sure that refugees are uh, able to feed back to us what they think about what we're doing. So while certainly corporate philanthropy is welcome and needed in the in the traditional sense. Um, as I started with, I think we, we need more than that, actually. Uh, we need corporate expertise. Um, whether it's technical expertise or your business processes, this needs to be brought more fully into uh, humanitarian action. Um, and I think we're starting to get at that as we get to know each other because it is two different organizational cultures between the humanitarian and the private sector. But we do have a lot of shared, uh, shared interests and and there is a lot of room to work, and so it's time to speed it up precisely because the, the situation we're facing is getting, uh, is getting more desperate. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, let's open the floor for questions. We have a microphone in the back. If you could state your name and organization for the sake of our online audience especially. We have a gentleman in the front here. Thank you very much. I'm right. I'm not from the Jordan Times. I have two questions, and I don't know who can answer them. So, for all, first question is that, is there like any political or security limitations hindering your efforts in sending technological service to refugees in the camps? And the second question, maybe Mr. Harper can answer me that. Maybe at the time that uh, international relief agencies are suffering from uh, budget deficits, and to the point that they can't send food to refugees. Can they talk about sending or providing refugee camps with technologies? Be seen as luxury? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And we had another gentleman also in the front row here. Thank you. Hani mm Mawad -hmm. uh, from Orient uh, Television. I want to ask, uh, ask Mr. Harber about uh, the electricity in uh, Zahatari camp and uh, Azraq camp. Uh, many people, many refugees called us uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, last two weeks and they said that there is no electricity at all in Zaatari camp uh, since uh, four months. Also, in, uh, people uh, from uh, Azraq camp, they said th there is no electricity. How we can deal with technology and community yeah. and there is no electricity mm -hmm. in camps? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Elena would hand the, uh, the first question over to you on the political constraints of uh, reaching the refugees. I think when it comes to Syria, I mean, Ericsson, we're in 180 countries, and Syria was, of course, one of the countries we have been in, but it's uh, due to the political security, all the things you mentioned, I would say it's very difficult to maintain and, and, and build mobile networks there today. You have sanctions uh, applying to Syria for companies, and then uh, for companies where other um, non-sanctioned companies like MTN, I know that they struggle quite a bit to 
keep the network up and running. So it's, uh, and from Ericsson's side, we have most of our employees now working from surrounding uh, countries. We, we can't really uh, maintain the, the base there. So I would say, it's a, yeah, almost uh, impossible to work from a commercial point of view right now. Elena, can I, uh, yeah. because uh, his question is purely Jordanian question. Uh, uh, and, and it's related to the political influence in refugees accessing technology. Yeah. Uh, no, Syrians have access to technology from day one they enter Jordan. And we get uh, all the help possible to make sure that we have the whole camps uh, covered, fully covered with the full access to technology. And uh, I don't think politics interfered at any point of time in this uh, matter. Thank you. Andrew, please. I, I think I'll probably be talking a little bit now on, uh, on all these issues. Um, I think going back to um, the question whether the technology is essential or is it a, is it a, is it a, a luxury, uh, we're now 2015. Technology is a need. Um, you can't survive in this world without it. Um, it, is, it accesses um, goods, it accesses services, it, it allows people to um, uh, keep in contact with, with everyone around them. And it's part of the reason why UNHCR is working so closely with everyone from Zane to Iris Guard to, um, to every private entity because uh, we need it to survive. Um, we now use registration using biometrics where we can check within a second four million records. So that cuts down on the potential for fraud. If you can cut down on the potential for fraud, it increases credibility, increases trust, so that allows us to, to work more effectively. In any country um, that we work in, Jordan being the prime example here, you still have to abide by the laws and regulations. Um, Zane can't go out and do something which, which is against the law. Same with UNHCR. So we work very closely with um, our communications partners and with the, with the government departments to make sure that what we're doing is not going against um, their interests because we also have to take into account that this is a pretty insecure part of the world and that there are valid reasons for um, some of the restrictions which are being put in place. That being said, if Jordan was not a, um, an enabling location for technology, we would not have moved our information support hub from Geneva to, to here. That was, that was an investment of millions of dollars. Um, we would also not have been successful in, it, in implementing a number of innovations here which are now being replicated around the world and that includes the call centre uh, which we developed with Zane and, and Cisco systems um, and we've also the biometrics with Iris Guard which is another system. So across the board um, we are actually um, leading the way in using technology and communications to improve the well-being of refugees but not only the well-being of refugees we also have to be uh, much more accountable uh, for what we do. For every dollar that I spend, I have to make sure it's, it, it's not being wasted because that could be a dollar that could be uh, used better off to help a refugee. So we're using um, technology to improve uh, our transparency, um, our communications, our efficiency, our effectiveness. But bottom line, we're using it to, to protect refugees because the amount of money being made available for refugees is decreasing. So that means we have to leverage whatever money we do have to improve the efficiency and effectiveness, and we're doing that. So just this week, and for people who see me on Twitter, we released $10 million worth of assistance to uh, probably about 100,000 refugees in Jordan, uh, including 60,000 children. The overhead for that was less than 1%. I dare any one of you to try and give me an example where you can deliver assistance or any product for less than 1% to the, to the end recipient, in this case it's refugees. And that was by using smart systems like uh, SMS, so we, we've got an agreement with, it, with Zane, so they, we can send out mass distribution to inform refugees to go to um, the Cairo Oman Bank, who've got Iris Guard uh, systems in place, so they can access it without in, engaging us. We don't want refugees to come to UNHCR to line up like as if they're they're, we're, that we're in a position of power and they're in a position of weakness. We want refugees to, to be normal people. And that is a normal person goes to a bank to get money out. They do not go to IRC or to UNHCR to beg for something. And so we have to change the whole mentality of, of, re, of how we treat refugees. And this is just one way which we're doing it. So it's not only a luxury, it is, it's an issue of, of, 
of an essential element of how we have to look at dealing with refugees in the future. Um, electricity in Azraq, Zartri camp, simple. Um, one element is, um, is technology again and private partnerships. Um, we don't have enough money to pay everyone's electricity bill. Simple as that. So when you have a refugee camp, and many refugee camps in the world do not have electricity. So with Zartri, we provided electricity, um, but it was costing $700,000, $800,000 a month. Is anyone here believe that donors are willing to pay me seven dollars to $800,000 a month to give electricity to refugees? Nope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, JD? Oh, no, this is dollars. It was about $500,000, um, $450,000, JDs. So, um, and so we have to make sure that refugees also value what is being provided to them. So we're, we're trying to manage the system in, um, in Zartri. And what was happening then was um, as soon as we put in the electricity, the transformers would be blown because everyone would be putting the heaters on. So we had, electricity will be reinstituted in, in Zartri, but it will be managed. It will be metered and people will be accountable for it. Because for those people who have been in Zartri, you would have seen all the private sector, this is a good example of private sector entrepreneurship, um, they were benefiting from it. And while you may have vulnerables who are not, so it's got to be better managed. In Azraq, we're working with the IKEA Foundation, uh, who will hopefully provide support for a solar farm there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, because we can provide electricity, but it's like water. When we provide water and electricity to a refugee camp, where do we get that from? We get it from Jordan. Yeah. And so you're taking it from the national grid. Everything that we do should be giving back to Jordan or contributing to Jordan. And so I could hook up the electricity grid in Azraq to the national grid, but you're withdrawing it from Azraq town and from Mufraq and elsewhere. What we should be doing is investing in renewable, sustainable energy. So refugees are not taking, but they're giving. And so inshallah, when they can go back to Syria, there's something left for the population there. So this is also why I'm saying that we need to be looking uh, in a long-term perspective looking at long-term investments, which will not only uh, help cut the cost in the short term for refugees, but will help Jordan in the long term. And as you see from uh, some of the announcements in Jordan over the last couple of weeks, Jordan is now, I think, the largest, um, has got the largest partnership with private sector solar engagement anywhere in the Middle East and North Africa. This is something which is proud of and which we, in the humanitarian sector, should all, all also be investing in. So moving away from um, oil, uh, fossil-based fuels into things which actually help the country, help the economy, help the environment, and help, most importantly, refugees. Thank you. Um, I think we have uh, time for the last two questions here. The, the gentleman on the left and the lady in the front, uh, mindful of the schedule of our panelists. Uh, please yeah. make it a short uh, question. My name is Thank Nikhil you. and I'm and I represent Media Quest from Dubai. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, you know, we're seeing a sort of conflation between uh, the refugee crisis and, and terrorism with, uh, uh, I mean, reports of some ISIL recruits jumping the ship to, to Italy and, uh, and so on. Uh, so how does that compound the problem of people working uh, on refugees? And the second one is uh, essentially a sort of donor fatigue setting in uh, when it comes to uh, protracted crisis, crises like the ones being witnessed in Syria. Uh, so how do you address that? Thank you. And the lady in the front here, let's take the question. Uh, it is Adoni for Al Monitor and Venture Magazine. Um, so you were all saying that uh, refugees are going to stay for a long time here in the country. Uh, there's one thing, they are prevented from working. So in the long run, this is not going to be sustainable because, I mean, we're, we're, we've been talking about donor fatigues as well. There's not enough money to provide them all with financial aid. And at a certain point, these people feel the need of working, especially if they are meant to be here for a long time. How are you going to um, tackle this problem, especially because then the large majority of Syrians who work here work in the informal sector, and this could provoke also distortion mm -hmm. to the local market. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Who would like to uh, take the question? Zain. <laughs> 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 um, I, I think, um, right. It's a tough question. Yeah. The, the, uh, but they can all be answered. Um, the security situation, as, as we discussed, begin, has never been sort of 
seen this bad before in the, in the region. And, um, and extremist groups such as, as we, like ISIS, is representing a, a threat um, not only to the region but to, to the wider, wider area. What the immediate impact of that is that there's been an increase in uh, refugees fleeing from those areas. And so in the last, um, let's say, last eight months, um, they were probably the number one reason why people were fleeing uh, to Jordan and probably elsewhere because of the advance of ISIS rather than from um, government bombing. Um, the humanitarian imperative has now been overwhelmed, replaced by a security imperative um, and the security narrative. So previously, um, it was very much about providing support to refugees, the vulnerables, how do we protect women and children. It's now ISIS. And uh, we have to be careful in regards to not mixing them up. And there's, it's very easy to have a default setting that um, everyone who comes from an area which could be under the influence of, of, of radical groups is a member of those radical groups. But what refugees are is that they're fleeing these groups. It's not to say that we should not strengthen, reinforce, do whatever's necessary to ensure that everyone who comes into a, a country of asylum is security screened, but security screening does not mean uh, closing down the border. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why we also invest in technology, because we need to ensure that governments like Jordan, the security apparatus here in Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq and elsewhere, mm -hmm have got the confidence in our registration ability to ensure that we can check who is who and that they don't change IDs and, and other types of documents. So it makes it more challenging, but it also raises the bar of, of how we have to deliver and makes it um, more, even more critical for us to be investing in everything from biometrics, um, face recognition, iris um, checking, um, and being much more accountable for what's going on. The other element is donor fatigue. Um, certainly, this is becoming a protracted crisis. And as Elaine was saying before as well, there's never been so many conflicts without an apparent end. And we're seeing also um, hundreds of thousands of people fleeing across the Mediterranean, um, increasing um, concern about security. But what we say is like there's too much money being spent on reaction. There's been very little being spent on prevention. And the first day of the, um, the World Economic Forum here, I was, I was privileged to be part of some of the, um, the groups looking at radicalization and extremism. And there's so many causes. There's never one cause for why somebody may, may join an extremist group or become radicalized. But what we're seeing is no money being given to any of them. Mm -hmm. And we need to be sort of looking back to sort of see how can we address these root causes, um, the, the triggers for people to, um, to move across. Because I think the last count there was um, jihadists from 70 to 80 countries in, in Syria. But what is this related to war? Well, pov can I, can I, yeah, poverty is one of the issues, but it's not the only issue. And what we need to be looking at is trying to find out how can we get people who are um, part of the already illegal um, uh, employment system to be part of the regular employment system. Don't force them underground so you, you don't know where they are. Don't force them into, uh, into poverty or where they can be potentially exploited, or where they're forced to go back into Syria. We need to make sure that those people who are in Syria, uh, who are in Jordan, can contribute to the economy in Jordan, and can be regulated, and that they can use the skills, and they can provide support to their families, and they can provide support to their communities, and they maintain their dignity. So, but, uh, Thank you very much. Uh, um, in Jordan, uh, just on the jobs uh, part, I'll just make it clear for you, in Jordan, uh, I mentioned at the beginning the registered refugees with UNHCR getting aid is 627,000, <laughs> while Syrian refugees in Jordan exceeds 1 million, and it's around 1.2 or 1.3 million, which means there is a big number of them who are not getting aid. Actually, they're living in Jordan, they're working in Jordan, and uh, they compete on, on jobs. And this is one of the challenges that we face in Jordan because we have a high unemployment rate that Syrians are competing on the Jordanian jobs. And I'm talking about people living in the camps. You're talking about kids, they cannot work. You're talking about uh, old people, uh, they cannot work. And you're talking about women, uh, maybe uneducated, unskilled laborers, uh, where the number of jobs available for them within the community they are in is not, is not too big. They created job opportunities for themselves within the camp. You have to create the economy within the camp as well. 
So, but some of them, they already have their own shops, uh, they do their own trades, uh, uh, and they created uh, some sort of income for themselves within the camp. It's a community of, uh, uh, for example, in Zatari, it's a community of around 100,000 people. How many are kids and uh, old people who cannot actually work, and how many who are actually eligible to be uh, uh, to work? Ahmed, I believe entrepreneurship or startup businesses or uh, some sort of these initiatives within the camp can can help a little bit. Mm. But there are some jobs created for the senior refugees, okay. and they do have some jobs here. Thank you, time. Ahmed. I think uh, we're, we're already running over time, and as I mentioned uh, initially, the conversation will be going on throughout the day about the refugee situation. Um, it will continue in the Al Arabiya TV session uh, later today, and because uh, our panelists have to be there, I, I have to um, uh, cut you off here. Sorry. Thank you very much for thank joining you. the panel. Thank you for watching us online, and thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thanks.